So a quick intro to this video. These are all photos from 1923 issues of the magazine Radio Broadcast. Radio in the US had only just become popular and mainstream in about mid-1922, so these photos give some glimpses into radio's early days as a well-known medium. Before that, it had pretty much been used exclusively by amateur hobbyists, and it's interesting to see how ubiquitous radio had become only about a year later, and all the different possibilities people saw on radio. These photos were sometimes scattered around the magazines with no further context, and other times they were part of articles I won't feature because they're too boring or technical. So I thought I would share them and their captions. I wouldn't call the photos rare per se, since these days you can easily access them online, but I don't think most of them appear on Google searches, so only the really biggest 1920s nerds have probably seen them. I found out when I was making my videos about 1920s radio that good photos of radio in the 1920s are a bit lacking on Google, and I felt like I had struck gold when I looked through magazines like Radio Broadcast, and now I feel like sharing them, so hopefully you can better understand the importance of radio in the 1920s in that simple format. So alright, let's get into it. Putting the Traveling Salesman on the Air at WGY Schenectady The scene is laid in a small railroad station, hence the telegraph instrument. The director's phones, padded to exclude all local sounds, are connected to a set outside, which is tuned to the concert. By holding up printed cards, he can inform the players how they are registering. An Englishman tells the bare facts. This diminutive British subject is rebroadcasting to his attentive companion the story of the three bears. Public school students broadcasting their prize compositions. Violet Miller, age 12, of school number 77, Ridgewood, Long Island, is on at WHN, while other budding writers await their turn. School number 77 is perhaps the first to hold a children's radio forum, an institution which not only stimulates a great interest in the writing of compositions, but gives the children excellent practice in public speaking. Listening to an address by Governor Pinchot in Orrstown, Pennsylvania. In this rural community, young and old gather in the little schoolhouse to hear the broadcasts received on the set owned and operated by Miss Hannah H. Kiefer, Director of Rural Education in the Cumberland Valley. This receiver, with the power amplifier, is used in 12 different community centers, and has brought in stations from Iowa to Texas and from Canada to Cuba. Listening to a broadcasting program at the Hotel Bellevue, San Francisco. This is said to be the first hotel in America to equip its dining room with radio. By using individual phones, the guests may listen when they wish to, but are not disturbed by a loudspeaker when they prefer to talk or eat. A Priceless Boon To an ordinarily active person who is forced by accident or illness to pass many long hours of inactivity, a broadcast receiving set is a blessing. William Snyder, repairman for the Bell Telephone Company, broke both arms and legs in a fall from a pole recently in Canton, Ohio. Friends among his fellow workers conceived the idea that a radio set might help to pass the tedious hours. Accordingly, a receiver was installed, and the patient was able to keep in touch with the world beyond his hospital window, hearing the concerts every afternoon and evening. Convalescing hospital patients find radio a great boon. It helps to pass pleasantly the time they must lie in bed or stay indoors. A whole troop of scouts should have little difficulty in earning enough to pay for the installation and upkeep of a set such as this in the hospital in their community. WEAF's New Home The large studio of the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, New York. From a control booth commanding a view of both studios, the announcer can cut in an artist in the small room, while an orchestra, for example, is preparing to go on in this one. The comfortable reception room, with doors leading to both studios. S.L. Rothafel filling the air with fun. He receives, on an average, 1,500 letters a week from listeners in who enjoy his witty announcements between selections broadcasted from WEAF via the Capitol Theater, of which he is the director. Frida Hempel sings Home Sweet Home as part of the celebration of the 100th anniversary of John Howard Payne, creator of the best-known song in the world. In the picture, Miss Hempel is shown at WJZ's Waldorf Astoria studio listening to an opera he heard in 1859. Christian Strom traveled from Oldesleben to Weimar, Germany, 64 years ago to hear the presentation of an opera composed by Wagner. 
This year, he heard on a crystal set the same music, broadcasted from WIP Philadelphia. Resolved that the Volstead Act should be repealed. It is estimated that the debate between Wayne B. Wheeler, right, General Counsel of the Anti-Saloon League, and Ransom H. Gillett, left, General Counsel of the Association Against the Prohibition Amendment, broadcasted on April 18th from WEAF New York, was heard by half a million people. This was the first time that two such leaders of opposing thought faced each other before the microphone on a subject of national interest and importance. At the finish of the debate, questions submitted by the audience were answered by the speakers. A poll of WEAF's audience showed decisively that Mr. Wheeler won the debate, and that the personal preference of the radio audience on the question, should the Volstead Act be repealed, was 57% no and 43% yes. Gathering weather reports at a powerful German station. The reports received from Paris, Warsaw, Christiana, London, and other cities are used to make up the daily forecasts broadcasted from this radio telegraph station located in Berlin. Nothing like this when he trod the quarterdeck. England's oldest sea dog, the Honorable Sir Edmund Robert Fremantle, Rear Admiral of the United Kingdom since 1901, recently listened to a concert broadcasted from the Eiffel Tower in the cabin of his old ship, HMS Impregnable. Admiral Fremantle entered the Navy in 1849, in the real days of ships of oak and men of steel, when muzzle-loading cannon lined the decks of tall-masted frigates. Listening to the government broadcast in an English home. The English experimenter has been going through a stage of development in radio construction familiar to all old-timers in this country. Working units of all sorts and sizes are placed on a board, and wired up regardless of compactness, appearance, and simplicity of operation. The Englishman has done some excellent work in constructing his own equipment, however, and some of the commercial companies produce apparatus that would be hard to beat anywhere. A Chinese student determining tube characteristics at Columbia University, New York. Mr. Xu S. Man, a graduate of Hong Kong University, came from China to do advanced research work in this country. He is here seen testing the amplification characteristics of a vacuum tube under various plate and grid voltages. Operators in the control room. Located in the Engineering Society's building, New York City, keeping the wires between New York and Chicago working at their best for the audiences in both cities, some 900 miles apart. Mr. Fred Parsons, 2ABM, at his station in New Rochelle, New York. The rebroadcasting station at Dundee, Michigan. Here is where the entertainment for a whole community is tuned in every evening. It is transferred to land wires running to the homes of the various subscribers, who pay $1.50 a month for the service. The music floods the local store. One drawback to this system of rebroadcasting is that if one subscriber doesn't like the selections provided, he cannot turn a knob and bring in something else. It's a case of take it or leave, the switch open. The Second District Amateurs 1923 Banquet at the Hotel Pennsylvania, New York City. Among the notables from Hamdom were Hiram Percy Maxim, Paul F. Godley, K.B. Warner, and many of the amateurs whose signals had been received in Europe. Two of them had accomplished this feat with 10-watt transmitters. Amateurs taking the code test at the Hotel Pennsylvania, New York. This receiving contest, held to determine the fastest operator in the second district, is an important feature at each annual convention. Not a soul aboard, controlled by radio. The old USS Iowa, picked as the moving target in the recent maneuvers off Panama, for the big guns of the super dreadnought, Mississippi. She was guided on her final trip by a delicate system of radio controls. Early in the battle, this apparatus aboard the Iowa was put out of commission, and she was sent to the bottom in quick time, it being no longer possible for her to evade the enemy fire. Experimenting with radio telephony in a New York trolley car. The Third Avenue Railway Company, in conjunction with the General Electric Company, has completed a series of experiments wherein radio carrier currents are used on the feeders and trolley wires of its overhead system as a means of communication between points on the system. The transmitters and receivers are similar in many respects to the general run of broadcasting outfits, and satisfactory communication has been established between substations and dispatchers' offices and the trolleys. 
Since the receiving point may be at any point of the line, emergency calls will reach their destination in record time, and the exact nature of the apparatus needed to remedy whatever troubles may develop will be transmitted. In this way, operating delays will be reduced to a minimum. Conductor George Dwyer is shown trying out the new apparatus. Sir Basil Thompson broadcasting his farewell to America. The former director of the Special Branch, Detective Division of Scotland Yard, giving from WJZ's Waldorf Astoria Studio in New York, his last talk before sailing for the Bahamas. Transmitting radio messages with the teletype machine. Chief Gunner J.J. Delaney at the Naval Radio Station, Washington, has only to press the keys as if using an ordinary typewriter. The letters, automatically put on the air as radio code signals, are instantaneously decoded again at the receiving station by a machine which also prints them, in English, exactly as they are sent. No handle to turn on this hurdy-gurdy. This outfit recently made its appearance on the streets of London, where all and sundry were regaled with radio melodies. Within the box is a four-tube receiver, and two loudspeakers facing in opposite directions. It is said that everyone from a newsboy to an MP can be stopped in his tracks at 200 yards range when this apparatus opens up. Winner of the Hoover Cup for the Best Amateur Station The Hoover Cup, awarded annually to the owner of America's Best Amateur Radio Station, has been presented to Frederick R. Ostman of Ridgewood, New Jersey, operator of Station 20M. This trophy is the highest honor in amateur radio, and is awarded by the Department of Commerce through Secretary Hoover to the best all-around amateur station, the major part of which is homemade. Mr. Frank Frimmerman's station, 2FZ, located in the Bronx, New York, was judged the second best amateur station. An apartment house station that supplies broadcasts to 72 tenants. The landlord of a Newark, New Jersey apartment house has installed a receiver in his building, which gets broadcast programs from all over the East and Middle West. Each family or tenant is a subscriber, having only to plug in phones or a loudspeaker on the line terminating in his own living room to receive the concerts that operator James Walsh tunes in. U.S. Forest Service Boats in Alaskan Waters the Wanagan, floating home of the men who patrol the Tongass National Forest, keeps in communication by radio with its motorboats. The latter serve as tenders, towing the houseboat from place to place along the shoreline, bringing supplies and performing various duties necessary to the protection of the territory. The TAM, shown at the left, is the headquarters boat, which has survived many storms and by the use of radio has helped to save both life and property. An automatic sender is a great help to the would-be telegrapher. He can turn it on at any time and receive code messages at any speed. This boy uses either the hand key or the machine to operate the small buzzer shown on the key baseboard. By comparing his own sending with the smooth, perfect sending of the machine, he is able to improve his own fist very quickly. Gob fans on the USS Maryland. Many homemade sets are turned out by radio enthusiasts in the Navy. This particular quartet, Arthur Johnson, Thomas Frank, Frank June, and Alvin Munn, are known as the Movie Gang, as they operate the movies on the Maryland. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Lady Doyle at WJZ While Lady Doyle broadcasted her views on spiritualism from the Radio Corporation station at Newark, Sir Arthur, known to everyone as the creator of Sherlock Holmes and lately come into public attention as one of the foremost investigators in the field of spiritualism, marveled at the potentialities of radio telephony. This is Station BG-4 of the 101st Signal Battalion, NYNG. Located in Herald Square, New York, this field station, Type SCR-67A, treats passersby with music and speech from local broadcasting stations, and also sends out recruiting talks on 200 meters. The receiving apparatus consists of detector and six stages of amplification, affording plenty of kick for the loudspeaker. Three radio corporation principles at the opening of Radio Broadcast Central. Left to right. Mr. Owen D. Young, Chairman of the Board of Directors, Dr. Alfred N. Goldsmith, Director of Research, and Major General James G. Harbord, President of the Radio Corporation of America. Their speeches marked the opening of the Aeolian Hall stations, WJZ and WJY, on May 14th. When a tube blows, it is necessary for the operator in the operating room on the roof merely to cut out the transmitter thus crippled and switch in another. 
there are two separate broadcasting channels, one for WJZ and one for WJY, and each channel is equipped with two transmitters. Besides the operating crew, there is a man constantly listening in for vessels in distress. If he hears an SOS, the broadcasting is immediately suspended. 